before um, before going to church in the morning for um, for mass, I uh, made my usual Sunday morning treat run to the uh, to the Starbucks, and I was I thought I was going to get a Starbucks, but I ended up not getting one because as I was entering the Starbucks parking lot, this woman rear-ended me. Mm -hmm. My 2014 Honda Accord V6. <laughs> and so I said, oh, what a, what a morning. But I got out of the car, and of course I was calm. It was, I was fine. And she got out of her car as well. And the first thing she did was she started, she was all frantic and nervous, and she started yelling. She says, my husband's going to kill me. <laughs> And so here I was uh, trying to console her. <laughs> now, mind you, my car was the one that was hit. Right. <laughs> and I'm trying to console her. And she's the one who hit my car. And so she says, uh, uh, boy, you, you know, you're the one trying to console me. Or I can't remember the words she used. And she says, that's really interesting. I'm the one who hit your car. And at that she says, why is that? Or something like that. And I, before I go into the Starbucks, I always take out my collar for <laughs> obvious reasons. Uh, lots. And so I t took it out of my pocket and I put it back in. I said, well, I'm in the, I'm in the business of consoling people. So. <laughs> so I also hope that, um, that all of you, when you, when you come to Mass, and also when you come here to the Bible study, that you feel some consolation from the Lord um, in, in the words that we hear here and that we share uh, consolation for this journey, this pilgrimage that we call life. And so with that, let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this great opportunity today as we contemplate your word. We thank you for the gift of your word in our life. Your word that comes to let us know that you are with us, you are walking with us, and that it will all be fine because you are with us. As we pray today, we glorify you now and forever, saying glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was Jewish. He was a Jewish man, and he knew his scripture very well. In the first reading from Nehemiah, the prophet Nehemiah, is, if you want to listen. So Ezra brought it to the place where the people had gathered men, women, and the children who were old enough to understand. There in the square by the gate, he read the law to them from dawn until noon, and they all listened attentively. Ezra was standing on a wooden platform that had been built for the occasion. As Ezra stood there on the platform high above the people, they all kept their eyes fixed on him. As soon as he opened the book, they all stood up. Ezra said, Praise the Lord, the great God. They gave an oral translation of God's law and explained it so that the people could understand it. When the people heard what the law required, they were so moved that they began to cry. So Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scholar of the law, and the Levites who were explaining the law, told all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God, so you are not to mourn or cry. Now go home and have a feast. 
Share your food and wine with those who don't have enough. Today is holy to our Lord, so don't be sad. The joy that the Lord gives you will make you strong. The word of the Lord. The Bible tells us very poignantly over and over again, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul, giving us refreshment and joy. Sometimes there is this idea that Jesus came to abolish the law. That is that he came to set up something different. And Jesus makes it very clear, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. As we heard here today. You know, I wish that it was somewhere in our creed that we say on Sunday, where we would have to be reminded every single Sunday that Jesus was born of a Jewish mother. Jesus taught us from his religion not from ours. We grew up in a religion about him. But all his disciples were Jewish. And of all the religions in the world to choose from, God decided on a Jewish mother to bear a Jewish son. And Jesus makes it extremely clear that he wants all of us to uphold all of the law. And he reminds us that whoever breaks the least of one of these commandments will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But those who keep the commandments of God, every single commandment will be called the greatest. For he tells us, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the scribes and the Pharisees kept all of the laws. You see, Jesus is calling us to be better to even supersede those who kept all of the commandments point by point by point. He's not getting rid of any of the commandments of God. God does not ask of us to be believed. God doesn't ask you to be, for you to believe in Him. God asks you to obey him for believing remember even the devil believes in god the devil knows god exists and the devil believes but god asks you to obey his law to be obedient this is the, the first sin that entered humanity this is why we fell as human beings the first human beings lived in paradise and God asked them to obey his laws and they didn't want to do it. They, this, we were created in freedom. We have freedom. We have a choice whether we will obey God or not. It's a choice you and I have. The devil, of course, chooses not to be obedient to God. He wants to be obedient to himself, to his own strength. We are to be obedient to God. And part of that obedience is to trust that the law of the Lord is perfect. It refreshes our soul. Whenever I talk to uh, young people, particularly those who are preparing for confirmation, I always uh, tell them, listen, it's not good for you to go to nightclubs, lead a loose lifestyle, engage in frivolous sexual activity before you are married, do drugs, get drunk. Now the Bible doesn't prohibit drinking, it prohibits getting drunk. The Bible says those who get drunk will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say those who drink. There's a big difference there. But I always tell them, you know, all of those things are not good. It's, 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 it's good for you to go to church every single Sunday, as the law of the Lord says. 
It's good for you to pray. It's good for you to stay away from the things that the world and the prince of the world, the devil, wishes for you to engage in. And they say to me, well, you want us to be like monks or nuns who have never tried, who've never tried what a nightclub is or what getting drunk is or what sexual activity is. You want us to be like prunes. <laughs> Let's live a little. Let's try. We are to try, to constantly try. And I always tell them, well, then you have the attitude of a pig. <laughs> If that is your attitude, that you are to live always wanting to try something new. Because remember, what does the pig do? It goes around all the time trying to, you know, <laughs> sniff out and to try. Let's try something different. We are not to have the attitude of pigs who always go about trying to get their nose into something into garbage. No, we are to have the attitude the Bible tells us of an eagle. The eagle flies, sees what's going on, and stays above it all. The eagle doesn't have to get into the mess. Doesn't have to try it to know that it's not good. All of us know the results of a sinful life that doesn't obey the commandments of God. You know how families are destroyed by drunkenness, how people's lives are destroyed by drunkenness. You know the results of nightclub life. You know the results of people who take drugs. You've seen that. We all know that. We know the result of uncontrolled sexual activity outside of the context of married life. You know that. You know the results of people who do not have God in their life. We all know that. And therefore, we can fly like the eagle and see everybody else doing and engaging in sinfulness. Sinfulness is disobedience to the law of God. We can look at it and we don't have to get involved. For we know the results. And yet, we as people, the Bible tells us, we are like dogs who prefer and always go back to eat their own vomit. It's, or, or in another way, the Bible says, we are like pigs who once they are washed clean, go back and get muddied again. Go back to their mud. And let me illustrate this in another way. Uh, you know, those, those of... Uh, I'm not going to say those of you, let's just say those of us who have ever gotten drunk, okay? Uh, and I, I know I can tell you things here because I know things will stay here, okay? You know, <laughs> nobody here gossips, so... <laughs> But those of us who have gotten drunk know the results. You know, the, the evening before when you are drinking, it feels great, right? You know, you, the vodka and grapefruit juice tastes absolutely wonderful. Here, I'm revealing my favorite drink, okay? Anyway, uh, it tastes absolutely wonderful. One, and then, you know, you go two and three and... But then when you wake up in the morning, it's like, Tylenol! Ty oh! The results are there in the morning. And then what happens? We know how it feels the day after, and yet so many of us will get drunk over and over and over again. It's, that's how we are as people. And this is what the Lord is asking us to avoid in our life. It's the same thing with any other sinful activity. We know the results that happen when we do not go to church 
or go to confession or pray, our soul becomes dry, devoid of meaning. And yet so many of us prefer that over and over again. Jesus did not come to get rid of the law of God. He came to complete it, to fulfill it. But the problem with so many of us in, in our life is that there is a lot of anti-Semitism. Lots of anti-Semitism. Lots of anti-Jewish feeling in us, which makes us think that, oh, you know, the Old Testament, even the way it's called, the Old Testament, right? I absolutely de despise that term, the Old Testament, because it makes it sound like it's not relevant. That's why in the, in the Catholic Church today, we prefer the term the Hebrew Scriptures, the scriptures of the Hebrew people, because they are just as relevant as the New Testament. They tell us about how to live. The commandments of God are there to be obeyed for all of us. And the Old Testament is clear in the book of Exodus that when we talk about the law, it is not Jewish law. It is the law of God. It's the law of God. It's God's law, not Jewish law. It's just as relevant for us. But the New Testament is full of the New Testament, so the Christian scriptures, is full of anti-Semitic references in it anti-Jewish references, which is why we as Catholics do not take the Bible literally, because the Bible is a product of the Christian community. It's written by human beings, fallible human beings. It's the Word of God, but it's written by human beings, so you have to take it in its context. So like, for example, uh, right now, uh, I'm sharing with all of you the Word of God, and I'm putting it for you in human terms. I'm explaining it to you. But I'm using my own humanity to do that. And so, let's say 90% of what I tell you is absolutely fantastic, but some of you might be offended by something I said. You know, it's my humanity coming through, and you're you, you hearing me. And it's the same thing with the writers of the Bible. They wrote from their humanity. And so a lot of their prejudices came through. And one of those is their anti-Semitic feelings, anti-Jewish feelings. Because, for example, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John, which have some anti-Jewish sayings in there, they were written for a Jewish community. They were ex-Jews, and the Jews at that time are persecuting the new Christian communities. The new Christians are persecuted by Jews, so they have anti-Jewish feelings in them, which is why that comes through. So, for example, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus calls a group of Pharisees children of hell. Jesus calls them that. In John's Gospel, Jesus tells some Jews that their father is the devil. Now, obviously, their father is not the devil. But the Johannine community, so remember, each, each of the Gospel writers, we have four of them in the Bible, they're writing for a particular Christian community that is experiencing some sort of turmoil and obstacles and problems and sufferings. And if you read the Gospel of John, there's a lot of persecution that they are experiencing. And so that anti-Jewish feeling is coming through. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul speaks of Jews who oppose God and who displease everyone, noting with satisfaction that God's wrath has overtaken them at last. We have to be very careful. That is why as 21st century Christians today, we have the church who comes to us and who interprets for us 
Holy Scripture. And Pope John Paul II, who comes from Poland, he's now a saint, Saint John Paul II. See, lots of good things come from Poland. <laughs> And Pope John Paul II, he was born in 1920. And he grew up in a town called Wadowice, which is not too far from Krakow, Poland. And when he was growing up, 1920 is before World War II. World War II started on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland. And he was born in 1920, and in his town, it was about 50-50. 50% of the town was Jewish and 50% of the town was Catholic. And this was pre-World War II Poland. After the war right now, there's very little Jews left because most of them were murdered in absolutely horrible ways by the Nazis during World War II. But in his town, there was a church, the main church in the square, and next to it was the synagogue. And everybody coexisted. They all lived together. The Jews and Catholics went to the same school and worshipped in different places of worship. And Pope John Paul II recounts how he would sometimes join his best friend, his best friend Jerzy Kluger, that was his best friend, who was Jewish. And later on, Pope John Paul II even attended his best friend's uh, daughter's wedding as Pope. And he recounts how he used to go and celebrate the Sabbath with his best friend at their home. And how on Sunday his friend would join his family for their family meal, their family Sunday celebration in his home. And so there was great coexistence there. And Pope John Paul II knew Judaism very well, which is why he was the first pope since St. Peter to visit a synagogue as Pope in 1986. And also he called Jews our elder brothers and sisters in the faith and calling us to great coexistence and respect for Judaism. And one of, the important, one of the important aspects to remember is that the law, in other words, works, are so very essential for us as Catholics. That we do believe, we believe that we are saved by grace, so God saves us by His grace. It's a gift when we are saved, when we come to uh, knowledge and acceptance of Jesus Christ in our life. The gift of faith, it's just that. It's a gift. When we say grace, it means it's a gift from God. Freely given, none of us deserve it. But works are essential to us as Catholics. So it matters what you do with your faith. So uh, you know that Christianity in many ways is divided between Protestants and Catholics. Protestant Christianity believes, for example, and you hear this all of the time, that all you have to do is confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and you are saved. Boom! You're a finished product. You're saved. We believe that works are essential. It's not just our faith, but it's our faith and our works. In other words, what we hear in James chapter 2, that you want to show me your faith, let me show you my works who testify to my faith. And this is in James chapter 2. And you can uh, listen to that. My friends, what good is it for one of you to say that you have faith if your actions do not prove it? So it's not enough for us to confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord. Anybody can do that. Our actions have to testify whether we are believers, people of faith, followers of the Lord Jesus. Can the faith save you? 
Can that faith save you? Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. Faith that doesn't have actions attached to it is dead. Actions are so very important for us. Therefore, the law is important to us. How we act is so very essential. It's not just the fact that I believe and I have been saved and there I'm now a finished product. Jesus has claimed me as, as his own. I have been baptized. Well, great. What would you like? You know, a cookie for that? Because you're... <laughs> Show me. Let your life testify to that. It's forgetting the necessity to incorporate works of mercy, which is particularly what this year the Pope is calling us to, to show our faith in works of mercy, kindness, understanding, all of us are called to that in our life. I remember very well uh, in my previous parish, every single Friday we had Eucharistic adoration. And it was at the end of morning mass till the evening, till five o'clock when we ended with benediction. And these group of uh, people, maybe about five or six they were ardent proponents of adoration. Very religious people. And I always say, you know, be careful with people who are overly religious. Some of the people who have hurt me the most in my life have been very religious people. And you, you know that from your own experience. How people who are very religious can sometimes be the worst. You know that. <laughs> And on that particular, one particular Friday, we had uh, a funeral that came in. And it needed to be celebrated at 2 o'clock. Because the family was coming in. Anyway, it was like a 40-some-year-old uh, man who had died of cancer. And I wasn't going to add any more pain to the family by not allowing them to have a funeral at 2 o'clock because we were having adoration on Fridays. And so I told the people, I said, we're going to stop adoration at about 1 o'clock and we will resume at about 4 o'clock. So your adoration time will be uh, interrupted from about 1 o'clock till 4 o'clock. Well, <laughs> I thought World War III had started. <laughs> Again, with this group of very religious people. And they came into the office and they started badgering the secretary in the office. And I was in, in the other room and I was overhearing this. How They were complaining, how can Father Adam do this? You know, he's putting the Lord away, aside. He has no respect for the Blessed Sacrament. How can he interrupt our Friday adoration? Huh? This is absolutely awful. Jesus is putting, being put in the corner. And I couldn't take this anymore. So I opened the door. <laughs> And I went out and I saw all of them standing there badgering the secretary and I said, all of you say that you are such people of faith. You're such religious people, right? Oh, yes, Father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. We are, you know, because they didn't know that I was there, I guess, so they started being all nice. And I said, and you say that you are such people of prayer. Oh, yes. Yeah, I said, you people of prayer? Stop. Stop praying. Stop praying. Because whatever you're doing is not working. <laughs> whatever you call prayer is not working. Because if your prayer does not lead you to have compassion and understanding and kindness for a family that has just lost a loved one that is in mourning and that is trying to put a funeral together, then whatever you're doing is not prayer. 
Stop and start over. And that's something for all of us to reflect upon. If our walk of faith, if I say I have faith, if my walk of faith is not leading me to more compassion, understanding of people, if it's leading me to judgment, passing judgment on others, if it's leading me to be critical, tearing others down, if that's, what, if, that, if, that, if that's what my faith or religion is leading me to. And you know, people, some of the people who are, uh, we call them Bible thumpers, right? You know, they can be some of the most judgmental people around. Who's gonna, who wants that? I would, who would want that? You don't want to be like that. Jesus is calling us to be normal. Under, and understanding is part of that. That everybody's walk is different. He's calling us to greater compassion. If I, at least the Jesus that I read about, that's what he's calling us to. The one that I have gotten to know. And all of us need to reflect on that in our, in our life. Catholic theology does say that we are saved by grace. But the church also teaches that while we are saved by grace, works are absolutely necessary. Let me uh, quote to you, let me quote to you from the Council of Trent. If anyone says that man can be justified by God by his own works, whether done by his own natural powers or by the teaching of the law without grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. In other words, let him be excommunicated. This is the Council of Trent in the 16th century, which is why the language is this way. If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. In other words, excommunicated. Works are so very necessary. In other words, you cannot be a jerk and say you're a follower of Jesus. If you're a jerk, you got to change. Being nice, kind, and understanding and compassionate are absolutely required. And don't despair. We're not finished products. Right? It's not like I confessed with my lips that Jesus is my Lord and boom, now I am a Christian and I'm... No, that's why constantly we have to change on a daily basis. I get up every day and I say, Lord, show me and tell me how is it that I can improve my walk with you. In fact, the church, for example, for priests every day in our daily prayers that we make before we go to sleep, we do something called night prayer. Part of that is the examination of conscience when we are asked to examine our conscience, look through our day and to see what it is that happened during this day that I can reform. And all of us should be doing that on a daily basis, looking for ways that I can change, improve, in other words, God's word, my walk with the Lord, has to be challenging me so as to change, so that I can be different and better. We're not finished products. We are works in progress. All of us. We're on the way. That's why this the Christianity from the beginning was called the way. It wasn't called Christianity. It was called the way. We are on the way where? To Jesus, to heaven. That's where we're headed. But that's exactly it. You are on the way. You are not there yet. So do not despair. And I want all of us to look at the second reading for this coming Sunday, which is from 1 Corinthians 12 when Paul is talking about the body that we are all the body of Christ 
And so if you would like to listen, Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts in the same way all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit, and we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? And if it were only an ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part of the body in the body just as he wanted it to be. There would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So then the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor can the head say to the feet, well, I don't need you. On the contrary, we cannot do without the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And those parts that we think aren't worth very much are the ones which we treat with greater care, while the parts of the body which don't look very nice are treated with special modesty, which the more beautiful parts do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honor to those parts that need it. And so there is no division in the body, but all its different parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. All of you are Christ's body, and each one is a part of it. All of you are Christ's body, and each one is a part of it. This is so very important for us to internalize that even though we are all different, we all make up one body in Christ. Paul is saying here, you are the body of Christ, not you as a community are like a body. The body of Christ expressed a substantial identity between Christ and the believers. Whatsoever you do to the least of these, my children, you do unto me. However you treat other people, if you hurt people, you're hurting Christ. When Mother Teresa was asked, how is it that she can do what she's doing, bandage the wounds of the lepers, she said, I'm doing it for Christ. Jesus is not somewhere out there removed from us that's easy you know that's why it's so easy to believe you know say god you're out there it's hard to say i believe in god in other people the god who manifests himself in others remember when paul was converted do you remember the conversion of paul all of you know it he was on the way to damascus and he's blinded and he's thrown down and God speaks to him. He's, he's on the floor. He's blinded. He's laying on the, on the ground. And God speaks to him. And Paul was Jewish. And he was a great persecutor of Christians. In fact, he participated at the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. We know that from the Acts of the Apostle. And Jesus speaks to him and says what? Saul, Saul. His name was Saul before he became Paul. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the Christians? Why are you participating in killing them? He says, why are you persecuting me? You see, Jesus identifies himself with you and I. That's why you and I are the body of Christ. Christ has no hands but yours. 
He's got no feet but yours. And he has no voice but yours. So am I using my gift, my gifts, to build up people or to tear them down? When I participate in the tearing down of others, I am participating in the work of the devil. When I participate in the edification, the building up of people, I participate in the work of Jesus. We are to glorify God in our bodies, for our body is holy. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And one of the gifts that you have is the gift of speech, word, something for us to reflect upon. How am I using that gift? One of the very important things uh, that happened to me in my life uh, were, I think it illustrates the, the, the big difference between being religious or being a believer and between being obedient to God and being a follower of Jesus Christ happened when I was in the seminary, I was sent to uh, Oaxaca, Mexico in order to study Spanish. Because if you go to the seminary and you want to be a priest today, if you speak English, you, will, you have to learn Spanish. As we have seminarians who do not speak English, they have to learn English. And so one of the things was I was sent to Oaxaca, Mexico to learn Spanish. And here, and you know, I'm going, and this is a very impoverished area of Mexico. It's uh, next to the state of Guerrero, which is where Acapulco is. Lots of people go there from here. But Oaxaca is a very impoverished place. And when I arrived there, the priest that I was going to be staying with, he says to me, you know, rather than you staying with me, it'd be better for you to stay with a family. That way you can learn the culture better. They have kids there. You can converse with them more. They can spend more time with you. I don't have that much time to devote to you. He, was, he had 26 different towns that he would travel to. And so he says, I have the perfect family for you to stay with. They have 16 children. <laughs> 16 kids. One mother and one father, okay, 16 kids. So that was 18, 18 people in the family. And here I thought to myself, where am I going to sleep? <laughs> uh, well, that wasn't the problem. And you know how here in the United States, we have bathrooms, all of us, inside of the house where we brush our teeth and take a shower, you know, as I did. I took a shower today out of charity for all of you, okay? <laughs> And, but over there, their, their sink was outside of the house where you brush your teeth and the, there was water there. And so my first night there, I brushed my teeth with this toothbrush that I got at Walgreens for like $4 to get ready for the trip uh, to Mexico. My brand new toothbrush. And I brushed my teeth and I left the toothbrush there. Uh, at, the, at the sink, okay? Because as I usually do, all of us, we leave our toothbrushes in our bathrooms, don't we? And uh, Well, and I went to sleep. Well, I got up in the morning, and here I see one of the 16 kids is using my toothbrush. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh no. I can share anything but not my toothbrush. <laughs> now you think that's a natural reaction in us, right? I mean, you know, we're from the United States and here I had this attitude and I went there with, this, with the attitude, you know, I'm from the United States. <laughs> not only that, I've already graduated college. I already had my bachelor's degree. I'm gonna teach these people. Not only that, I'm a seminarian. <laughs> I'm going to be a priest. I'm going to teach them. And he saw that I, I got visibly agitated. I mean, I was, I was angry. Okay, that he's using my toothbrush. 
And at that, he picked up the one toothbrush that they had. They had one toothbrush for all 16 kids and two adults. He picked up the one toothbrush they had and he says to me, don't worry, you can also use our toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry you can also use our toothbrush here I went this he, there with this superior attitude I was, a, I was a religious person I was a couple years away from being ordained a priest I had went through the seminary for a long time I knew the rules left and right knew them very well as do many of us here, I would say. Many of you know the rules really well. But I wasn't a follower of Jesus the way he expects me and you to be. I went there trying to teach them something, and here they taught me. Selflessness. It's all about our attitude. What is my attitude in life? How do I approach the people in my life? Is everything I have mine? Or is everything that I have given to me to be shared? What is the attitude that I lead my life with? And with that, we go to the Gospel for this coming week. And it's Luke's Gospel. The beginning of Luke's Gospel, as we look at many people have done their best to write a report of the things they have that have taken place among us. They wrote what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed the message. And so, because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. I do this so that you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. Then Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the new Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to announce the time of favor of the Lord. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him as he said to them, this passage of scripture has now come true as you have heard it being read to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Luke, the writer of Luke's Gospel, he also wrote the book of Acts. He was a physician. Those who work in the medical field can identify with the joy Luke felt when he could bring healing to a sick person. But for Luke, something more important was the healing his work as a believer could bring to people. His work as a partner of God's work here on earth. We are all partners with God in bringing the healing into the world. 
Luke thrived on the belief that God has become one of us and that no matter how bleak things may look at any given time, life will never be the same. Life will never finally be lost. We remember Luke as a physician, but the fact is that once he had been baptized, like all of us, into the body of Christ, he assumed a new identity. So when he would fill out an occupation form, it would not say physician, but disciple. Luke never resigned his job as a healer. He just changed medicines. Instead of prescribing bed rest, potions, herbs, and spices, which is what physicians prescribed at that time, Luke told stories to mend broken lives, as you and I are called to do as well. See, he, he spoke the word to heal, to mend. So many, of, uh, so many people are... are say, well, I, I show tough love to my family members or to friends. Does God show tough love to you? Think about that. God shows mercy and kindness. And what do you do? Instead of pills, Luke used words like, weep no more. Is that how you speak to other people? Or do you always have to have something negative to say? tear somebody down, point out their faults. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid. That's what, those are the words he uses. Your sins are forgiven. Stand up and walk. You know, as a priest, I meet so many people who have such broken lives. All of us. I always feel like God hasn't called me to tear anybody down any more than they are already torn down. If somebody comes, for example, to confession, they're already beaten up. They don't need a priest to beat them up anymore. If somebody that you encounter in your life comes to you or that you meet in your life, they're already beaten up as it is. Are you adding any more burdens to them? You, you contributing to beating them up even more? It's, sometimes it's just as simple as a smile. I met this one young man who was 25 in a, in a hospital. He was 25 and he tried to commit suicide at 25. He was unsuccessful. And he says to me, you know, on the day that I tried to take my own life, I said to myself, I'm going to go and take a walk and I'm going to try to see if I can find one person to smile at me. Well, needless to say, he didn't find that one person. He tried to take his life. Sometimes it's just as easy as a smile. But no, it's easier to frown, as so many of us do. Gospel medicine is medicine that works through words. Hence the ultimate word, Jesus. So many people say to me, you know, Father, we should be receiving communion on the hand because our hands are dirty. We, they say, Father, we should be receiving communion on the tongue because our hands are dirty. And the church says, it's okay if you want to receive on the tongue, but receiving on the hand, there's nothing wrong with that. Why? Because what's more dirtier in a person? The tongue or the hands? Your tongue. How much destruction and slander is done by our tongue? Jesus' ministry is not of actions, but word, not just of actions, but words. He has been anointed to preach the good news of release, recovery, sight, and liberty. Jesus' ministry is not just of doing, but saying what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. 
The word was spoken and the world was created. And when the word is spoken, the word is created over and over and over again. In other words, the good news, isn't that what we call gospel means the good news? Are you sharing good news or are you a bearer of bad news? When you're always repeating bad things to people, always telling them what's wrong with them, pointing out their faults and failures. You're not a bearer of good news. Isn't it true that every one of us arrived at faith because someone told us? How many of us just need to hear some gospel medicine today? We all do. I hope that you're hearing that. You know, maybe you haven't heard in a long time that God loves you and cares for you and accepts you just the way you are, unconditionally. I always, one of the first things I say to people in confession is always, do you know that God loves you? And so many people break down crying because they, they don't feel loved. They feel like there's something wrong with them. You know, how many people feel like they're victims in life? that they have been victimized by their parents, by their circumstances in life, by where they come from. Not, none of us is a victim. We're all victorious in Jesus Christ, who loves us as we are. And God has brought you here today. God has brought you thus far, and He will bring you further until He brings you home with Him. That's good news that all of us need to hear. People talk and lives change. People talk and someone is healed, someone is made whole. This is the word that we use for that called evangelizing, the telling of, a good, of the good news. There's a million ways to proclaim the good news. In other words, as St. Francis taught us, we are to preach the gospel at all times and only when necessary use our words. Your actions your smile, your acceptance of people, listening to others. How many people need to be listened to? Most of the time when people say to me, Father, I want some of your advice. They don't really want my advice. What they want is they want me to listen to them. They just want to be listened to. So many of us, we want to be listened to because when we are heard, we feel affirmed. Do you do that in your life with the people around you? Or do you always need to talk? There's a reason why God gave you one mouth and two ears. <laughs> Reading Psalms to a sick friend, telling the truth to someone who has asked for it, ending a quarrel with words of forgiveness, listening to a person's story, laughing at someone's joke that isn't necessarily funny. You know, inviting someone to eat that maybe bothers you. You know, maybe you don't really want to have that person over, but you're going to step out of your comfort zone. Gospel medicine works all the time because all we really need is to hear those words of God our Father. You are my beloved son. Even when the son is hanging on a cross, you are my beloved son. How many of us through our life experiences hang on a cross so many times? The hanging on a cross just means the suffering, the, the burdens, the problems. Even when you're hanging on a cross, burdened by your, by your life and all that you have to go through, you are still the beloved son or daughter of God. Isn't that, that is just... It's absolutely wonderful. You are my beloved, as poor as you might be. You are the light of the world, even if you are feeling like your light is dim. On the one hand, the gospel is just words. Weep no more. Do not be afraid. Stand up and walk. And sometimes we may feel like prescribing them is a futile is as futile as putting a bandage on a broken bone or giving an aspirin to someone who is dying. But when we proclaim these words as gospel, as good news, we say that these words belong to someone. And when we speak them, someone is present. 
speaking them with us, speaking them through us, so that we never speak them alone. These words affect what they proclaim. They dry tears, quench fears, forgive sins, heal souls. Do you know that when, in, in confession, do you know when forgiveness happens? When the priest says, I absolve you of your sins. That's when forgiveness happens. It's words. When you hear that, I'm forgiven. Anything and everything that I have done, I'm forgiven. Healing. That's why Jesus says, what's easier? Tell the paralytic, pick up your mat and walk, or tell him your sins are forgiven. It's the healing of the soul. That's what we need. Gospel medicine. Pass on the glad tidings. Pass on the glad tidings. The glad tidings that you have received from the people who proclaimed them to you. Pass them on. Share the good news. Share the good news. Let us all be co-partners with God in the healing of the world. One good word at a time. One good word at a time. One toothbrush at a time. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this time together, for all the blessings that you have given us. We claim you as our Father, and we are your children. And we ask you to continually bathe us in your presence that we may know how loved we are. And when we know how loved we are, we can then work to please you, to obey you, and to live the life that you have chosen for us. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day. May the Lord be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you for being here. A couple of announcements before you go. Please do not forget, if you haven't signed in with your email, if you haven't received an email from me, how many of you...